why did we get to leave? That's funny. I like that. I'm sorry, no. No. What if some people don't know how to read? That would be kind of well. That's your own fault that you chose to go to Wing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> chapter six. Where's Randy? Randy? Where's Randy? <laughs> What Chapter 62. A few evenings later, Claremont cocktail hour. It began at 6 or 6.30, depending on when people wandered up the hill to the big house. The cook was finishing supper and had set out salmon mousse with little flowery crackers. I went past her and pulled a bottle of white wine from the fridge for the aunties. The littles, having been down at the big beach all afternoon, were forced into showers and fresh clothes by Gat, Johnny, Mirren, and Mirren at Redgate where there was an outdoor shower. Mommy, Bess, and Carrie sat around the Claremont coffee table. I brought wine glasses for the ants as Granddad entered. So, Penny, he said, pouring himself bourbon from the decanter on the sideboard. How are you and Katie doing at Woodmere this year, with the change of circumstances? Bess is worried that you're lonely. I didn't say that, said Bess. Carrie narrow narrowed her eyes. Yes, you did, Granddad said to Bess. He motioned for me to sit down. You talked about the five bedrooms, the renovated kitchen, how Penny's alone now and won't need it. Did you, Bess? Mommy drew a breath. Bess doesn't reply. She bit her lip and looked out at the view. We're not lonely, Mommy told Granddad. We adore Winmere, don't we, Katie? Granddad beamed at me. You okay there, Cadence? I knew what I was supposed to say. I'm more than okay there. I'm fantastic. I love Winmere because you built it specially for Mommy. I want to raise my own children there and my children's children. You are so excellent, Granddad. You are the patriarch, and I revere you. I'm so glad I'm a Sinclair. This is the best family in America. What does the word revere mean? Paul. Not Paul Revere. <laughs> I knew that he was. I knew that that was going to be the first you response. Look up to them. You look up to them. Thank you, Brady. You may have a piece of candy now. I'm not going to be able to catch that. You do throw it, bro. Sorry, I was afraid to hit Shelby. Not in those words, but I was meant to help Mommy keep the house by telling my grandfather that he was the big man and he was the cause for all of our happiness. And by reminding him that I was the future of the family, the all-American Sinclairs would perpetrate ourselves, tall, white, and beautiful, and rich, if only he let Mommy and me stay at Windmere. I was supposed to make Granddad feel, feel in control when his world was spinning because Gran had died. I was to beg him by praising him, never acknowledging the aggression behind his question. My mother's and her sisters were dependent on Granddad and his money. They had the best educations, a thousand chances, a thousand connections, and they still ended up unable to support themselves. None of them had anything useful in the world, nothing necessary, nothing brave. They were still little girls. Hey. Right in front of you, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, wrapping it up. They were still um, they were still little girls trying to get in good with Daddy. He was their bread and butter, their cream and honey too. It's too big for us, I told Granddad. No one spoke as I left the room. Mommy and I were silent on the walk back to Windmere after supper. Once the door shut behind us, she turned on she turned on me. Why didn't you back me with your grandfather? Do you want us to lose this house? We don't need it. I picked the paint, the tiles, I hung the flag from the porch. It has five bedrooms. We thought you would have a bigger family. Mommy's face was tight. But it didn't work out that way. That doesn't mean I don't deserve the house. Miriam and those guys could use the room. This is my house. I don't, you can't expect me to give it up because Bess had too many children and left her husband. You can't think that it's okay for her to snatch it from me. This is our place, Cadence. 
You've got to look, we've got to look out for ourselves. Can you hear yourself? I snapped. You have a trust fund. What does that have to do with it? Some people have nothing. We have everything. The only person we use who used the family for family's money for charity was Gran. Now she's gone and all anyone's worried about is her pearls and her ornaments and her real estate. Nobody is trying to use their money for good. Nobody's trying to make the world any better. Mommy stood up. You're filled with superiority, aren't you? You think you understand what the world is so much better than I do? You think you understand the world so much better than I do? I've heard Gat talking. I've seen you eating up his words like ice cream off a spoon. But you haven't paid bills. You haven't had a family, owned property, seen the world. You have no idea what you're talking about. And yet you do nothing but pass judgment. You are ripping up this family because you think you deserve the prettiest house. Mommy walked to the foot of the stairs. You go back to Claremont tomorrow. You tell Granddad how much you love Windmere. Tell him how you want to raise your own kids spending summers here. You tell him. No, you should stand up to him. Tell him to stop manipulating all of you. He's only acting like this because he's sad about Grand, can't you tell? Can't you help him or get a job so his money doesn't matter? Or leave Bess the house? Listen to me, young lady. Mommy's voice was stealing. You go and you talk to Granddad about Windmere, or I will send you to Colorado with your father for the rest of the summer. I'll do it tomorrow, I swear. I'll take you to the airport first Airport first thing. You won't see that boyfriend of yours again, understand? She had me there. She knew about me and Gat, and she could take him away. Would take him away. I was in love. I promised whatever she asked. When I told Granddad how much I adored the house, he smiled. And he knew someday that I'd have beautiful children. Then he and Bess, then he said Bess was grasping, a grasping wrench, wench, not wrench, a grasping wench, who had no intention of giving her my house. But later, Mirren told me he'd promised Windmere to Bess. I'll take care of it, he said. Just give me a little time to get Penny out. So now Granddad's playing them against each other. Well, you see, her mom is a bad person. I'll just say that. We've caught on to that, that they're selfish and want money. Chapter 64. Gat and I went out to the tennis court in the twilight a couple of nights after I fought with Mommy. We tossed balls for Fatima and Prince Philip in silence. Finally, he said, have you noticed Harris never calls me by my name? No. He calls me young man. Like, how was your school year, young man? Why? It's like if he called me Gat, he'd really be saying, how was your school year, Indian boy, whose Indian uncle lives in sin with my pure white daughter? Indian boy I caught kissing my precious cadence. You believe that's what he's thinking? He can't stomach me, said Gat. Not really. He might like me as a person, might even like Ed, but he can't say my name or look me in the eye. It is true. Now that he said it, I could see it. I'm not saying he wants to be the guy who only likes white people, Gat went on. He knows he's not supposed to be that guy. He's a Democrat. He voted for Obama. But that doesn't mean he's comfortable having people of color in his beautiful family. Gat shook his head. He's fake with us. He doesn't like the idea of Carrie with us. He doesn't call Ed Ed. He calls him Sir. And he makes sure that I know I'm an outsider every chance he gets. Gat stroked fat in his soft, doggy ears. You saw him in the attic. He wants me to stay the hell away from you. I hadn't seen Granddad's interruption that way. I'd imagined he was embarrassed at walking in on us. But now suddenly I understood what had happened. Watch yourself, young man, Granddad had said. Your head, it could get hurt. It was another threat. Did you know my uncle proposed to Carrie back in the fall? Gat asked. I shook my head. We've been, they've been together almost nine years. He acts like a dad to Johnny and Will. He got down on his knees and proposed, Katie. He had the three of us boys there and my mom. He decorated the apartment with candles and roses. We all dressed in white, and he brought, bought a big meal from this Italian place Carrie loves. He put Mozart on the stereo. Johnny and I were all, Ed, what's the big deal? She lives with you, dude. But the man was nervous. He bought a diamond ring. Anyway, he came home, and the four of us left them alone and hid in Will's room. We were supposed to all rush out with congratulations. But Carrie said no. I thought they didn't see the point in getting married. Ed sees the point. Carrie doesn't want to risk her stupid inheritance, Gat said. She didn't even ask Grandad? That's the thing, said Gat. Everyone's always asking Harris about everything. Why should a grown woman have to ask her father to approve of her wedding? 
Granddad wouldn't stop her. No, said Gat. But back when Carrie first moved in with Ed, Harris made it clear that all the money earmarked for her would disappear if she married him. The point is, Harris doesn't like Ed's color. He's a racist bastard, and so is Tipper. Yes, I like them both for a lot of reasons, but they have been more, and they have been more than generous letting me come here every summer. I'm willing to think that Harris doesn't even realize why he doesn't like my uncle, but he, he dislikes him enough to disinherit his eldest daughter. Gat sighed. I love the curve of his jaw, the hole in his t-shirt, the notes that he wrote me, the way his mind worked, the way he moved his hands when he talked. I imagined then that I saw him completely. I leaned in and kissed him, and it seemed so magical that I could do that, and that he would kiss me back. So magical that he showed our, we showed our weaknesses to one another, our fears and our fragility. Why didn't we ever talk about this? I whispered. Gat kissed me again. I love it here. The island, Johnny, Mirren, the houses and the sound of the ocean. You, you too. Part of me doesn't want to ruin it. it doesn't even want to even imagine that it isn't perfect. I understood how he felt, or I thought I did. Gat and I went down to the perimeter then and walked until we got to a wide, flat rock that overlooked the harbor. The water crashed against the foot of the island. We held each other and got halfway naked and forgot. For as long as we could, every horrid detail of the beautiful Sinclair family. So he's, like, opening up to her. He's very concerned, and she doesn't see it. Um... When does part five start? I think we can get through it today. Chapter 65. Once upon a time, and you'll notice that when we put all of these shorter stories that she's telling together, that they're actually kind of telling the story of what happened as she, this is her piecing it together. Once upon a time, there was a wealthy merchant who had three beautiful daughters. He spoiled them so much that the younger two girls did little all day but sit in the mirror gazing at their own beauty and pinching their cheeks to make them red. One day the merchant had to leave on a journey. What shall I bring you when I return, he asked. The youngest daughter requested gowns of silk and lace. The middle daughter requested rubies and emeralds. The eldest daughter requested only a rose. Have you ever read a story or heard a story, watched a movie, where that's all that someone requested was a rose? It's a, it's a Disney movie. Watching it. Beauty and the Beast? It's Beauty and the Beast. Yep. Well, in the original story, uh, the original stories, not the Disney versions, are always much grimmer. Yeah. Um, and that's what she requested was a rose. And then I do believe everyone dies at the end. Yeah. <laughs> the original Beauty and the Beast, not the Disney version. The Disney version is all... Yeah, if you ever find, like, the original stories, not the Disney version, they're always a whole lot. Yeah, the Some of the earlier Disney stuff was pretty dark. They're usually Hans, well, Frozen was Hans Christian Andersen. I don't know. So, Look them up sometime. So, yeah, it's the same idea, but a lot darker. A lot more people die. The merchant was gone for several months with his youngest daughter. He filled a trunk with gowns of many colors. For his middle daughter, he scoured the markets for jewels. But only when he found himself close to home did he remember his promise of a rose for his oldest child. He came upon a large iron fence that stretched along the road, and the distance was a dark mansion, and he was pleased to see a rose bush near the fence bursting with red blooms. Several roses were easily within reach. It was the work of a minute to cut a flower. The merchant was tucking the blossom into his saddlebag when an angry growl stopped him. A cloaked figure stood where the merchant was certain no one had been a moment earlier. He was enormous and spoke with a deep rumble. You take from me with no thought of payment. Who are you? The merchant asked, quaking. Suffice it to say, I'm the one from whom you steal. The merchant explained that he had promised his daughter a rose after a long journey. You may keep your stolen rose, said the figure, but in exchange, give me the first of your possessions you see upon your return. Then he pushed his hood, back his hood to reveal a face of a hideous beast, all teeth and snout, the wild boar combined with the jackal. You've crossed me, said the beast. You will die if you cross me again. The merchant rode home as fast as his horse could carry him. He was still a mile away when he saw his eldest daughter waiting for him on the road. 
We got word you would arrive this evening, she cried, rushing into his arms. She was the first of his possessions he saw upon his return. He knew what the price of the beast had truly asked of him. Then what? We all know that the beauty grows to love the beast. She grows to love him despite what her family may think. For his charm and his education, his knowledge of art and his sensitive heart. Indeed, he is human and always was one. He was never a wild boar or jackal at all, only a hideous illusion. Hmm, illusion. Trouble is, it's awfully hard to convince her father of that. Her father sees the jaw and the snout. He hears the hideous growl whenever the beauty brings her new husband home for a visit. It doesn't matter how civilized or erudite the husband is. It doesn't matter how kind. The father sees a jungle animal, and his repugnance will never leave him. So if you use our character chart back behind Joseph, the red one, who's the oldest daughter? Of Harrison Tipper, who's the oldest daughter? Mm -mm. It goes from left to right. Amy. From left to right, Brayden. Do you know you're left and right? No. Amy. Carrie. It's Carrie. And who is Carrie? Well, not married to, but engaged to. Ed. Ed. That's a plus sign. Okay, I'll I'll put a tiny T. I'll fix. Okay, so in our story, who is Carrie? The eldest daughter. And who is Ed in this short story? The Beast. Yep. Let's see. I'm going to take it. I need some candy. Well, then, I'm like, the first one to answer. I got the right answer to you. No, you look. You were. You I said from left to right, and you said penny. I answered. What's Doesn't mean your answer was right. Hey, there's one here, and there's one back there. <clears throat> okay, chapter 66. One night, summer 15, Gat tossed pebbles at my bedroom window. I put my head, put out my head to see him standing among the trees, moonlight glinting off his skin, eyes flashing. He was waiting for me at the front of the porch steps. I have a dire need for chocolate, he whispered, so I'm raiding the Claremont pantry. You coming? I nodded. We walked together up the narrow path, our fingers entwined. We stepped around the side entrance of Claremont, the one that led to the mudroom filled with tennis rackets and beach towels. With one hand on the screen door, Gat turned and pulled me close. His warm lips were on mine. Our hands were still together. There at the door to the house, for a moment, the two of us were alone on the planet. With all the vastness of the sky and the future and the past spreading out around us. We tiptoed through the mudroom and into the large pantry that had opened off the kitchen. The room was old-fashioned with heavy wooden doors and shelves for holding jams and pickles back when the house was built. Now it stored cookies, cases of wine, potato chips, root vegetables, seltzer. That's like fizzy water. We left the light off in case someone came into the kitchen, but we were sure that Granddad was the only one sleeping at Claremont. He was never going to hear anything in the night. He wore a hearing aid by day. We were rummaging when we heard voices. It was the ants coming into the kitchen, their speech slurred and hysterical. This is why people kill each other, Beth said bitterly. I should walk out of this room before I do something I regret. You don't mean that, said Carrie. Don't tell me what I mean, shouted Bess. You have Ed. You don't need the money like I do. <clears throat> You've already dug your claws in the Boston house, said Mommy. Leave the island alone. Who did the funeral arrangements for Mother, snapped Bess. Who stayed by Dad's side for weeks? Who went through the papers, talked to the mourners, wrote the thank you notes? You live near him, said Mommy. You were right there. I was running a household with four kids and holding down a job, Bess said. You were doing neither. A part-time job, said Mommy. And if I hear you say four kids again, I'll scream. I was running a household too, said Carrie. Either of you could have come for a week or two. You left it all to me. I'm the one who has to deal with Dad all year. I'm the one who runs over when he wants help. I'm the one who deals with his dementia and his grief. Don't say it, said Carrie. You don't know how often he calls me. You don't know how much I have to swallow just to be a good daughter to him. So damn straight I want the house, continued Bess, as if she hadn't heard. I've earned it. 
who drove mother to her doctor's appointment, sat by her bedside. That's not fair, said mommy. You know I came down. Carrie came down too, to visit his best. You didn't have to do all that stuff, said mommy. No one asked you to. No one else was there to do it. You let me do it, and you never thanked me. I crammed into Cuddle Down, and it has the worst. I'm crammed into Cuddle Down, and it has the worst kitchen. You never even go there. You'd be surprised how run down it is. It's worth almost nothing. That's like all kinds of false, but okay. Mother fixed up the Windmere kitchen before she died, and the bathrooms at Redgate. But Cuddle Down is just as it ever was, and here you two are begrudging me compensation for everything that I've done and continue to do. You need. You agreed to the drawings for Cuddle Down, snapped Carrie. You wanted the view. You have the only beachfront house, Bess, and you have all of Dad's approval and devotion. I think that wouldn't be enough for you. Lord knows it's impossible for the rest of us to get. You chose not to have it, said Bess. You chose Ed. You chose to live with him. You chose to bring Gat here every summer when you know he's not one of us. And you know the way Dad thinks. You're not the only one who's kept... Who You're not... And you not only kept running around with Ed, you bring his nephew here and parade him around like a defiant little girl with a forbidden toy. Your eyes have been open, wide open this whole time. Shut up about Ed, said Carrie. Just shut up. Shut up. There was a slap. Carrie hit Bess across the mouth. Bess left, slamming doors. Mommy left, too. Gat and I sat on the floor of the pantry holding hands, trying not to breathe, trying not to move while Carrie put the glasses in the dishwasher. Chapter 67. A couple of days later, Granddad called Johnny into his Claremont study, asked Johnny to do him a favor. Johnny said no. Granddad said he would empty Johnny's college fund if Johnny didn't do it. Johnny said he wasn't interfering in his mother's love life, and he would bloody well work his way through community college then. Granddad called Thatcher. Johnny told Carrie. Carrie asked Gat to stop coming up to supper at Claremont. It's riling Harris up, she said. It would be better for all of us if you just made some macaroni at Redgate, or you, or I can have Johnny bring you a plate. You understand, don't you, just until everything gets sorted out? Gat did not understand. Johnny didn't either. All of us liars stop, stopped coming to meals. Soon after, Bess told Mirren to push Grandad harder about Windmere. She was to take Bonnie, Liberty, and Taft with her to talk to him in his study. They were the future of this family, Mirren was to say. Johnny and Katie didn't have the math grades for Harvard, while Mirren did. Mirren was the business-minded one, the heir to all granddad stood for. Johnny and Katie were too frivolous. The, and look at those beautiful littles, the pretty blonde twins, the freckle-faced Taft. They were Sinclairs, through and through. Say it all, say all of that, said Bess, but Mirren would not. Bess took her phone, her laptop, her allowance. Mirren would not. One evening, Mommy asked me and Gat, Granddad knows something is going on with you two. He isn't happy. I told her I was in love. She said, don't be silly. You're risking the future, she said. Our house, your education, for what? Love. A summer fling. Leave the boy alone. No. Love doesn't last, Katie. You know that. I don't. Well, believe me, it doesn't. We're not you and Dad. I said, we're not. Mommy crossed her arms. Grow up, Cadence. See the world as it is, not as, it, as you wish it would be. I looked at her, my lovely tall mother, with her pretty coil of hair and her hard, bitter mouth. Her veins were never open. Her heart never left out to flop helplessly on the lawn. She never melted into puddles. She was normal, always, at any cost. For the health of your family, she said eventually, you are to break it off. I won't. You must, and when you're done, make sure Granddad knows. Tell him it's nothing and it never was anything. Tell him he shouldn't worry about the boy ever again. And then talk to him about Harvard and tennis team and the future you have in front of me or in front of you. Do you understand me? I did not and I would not. I ran out of the house and into Gat's arms. I bled on him and he didn't mind. Late that night, Mir and Gat, Johnny and I went down to the tool shed behind Claremont. We found hammers. There were only two. So Gat carried the wrench and I carried a pair of heavy garden shears. I got it. Uh, the Down syndrome go. <laughs> Put eleven charges on your mobile. What? Fuck. Uh -huh. 
Where it's going. It wasn't about this film coming out. I was right. <laughs> Late that night, Mirren, Gat, Johnny, and I went down to the tool shed behind Claremont. We found hammers. There were only two, so Gat carried a wrench and I carried a pair of heavy garden shears. We collected the ivory goose from Claremont, the elephants from Windmere, the monkeys at Redgate, and the toad from Puddledown. We brought them down to the dock in the dark and smashed them with the hammers and the wrench and the shears until the ivory was nothing but powder. Gat ducked a, a bucket into the cold seawater and rinse the dock clean. Chapter 68. We thought. We talked. What if, we said, what if in another universe, a split reality, God reached out his finger and lightning struck the Claremont house? What if God sent, up it, sent it up in flames? Thus he would punish the greedy, the petty, the prejudiced, the normal, and the unkind. He would repent their, they would repent of their deeds. After that, learn to love one another again. Open their souls, open their veins, wipe off their smiles, be a family, stay a family. It wasn't religious the way we thought of it, and yet it was. I'm Punishment. Sorry. He's over a mess, yeah, it's, it's like burning my eyes. Oh my, <laughs> Preston. I said safety. 
<laughs> that doesn't make it any better. Stop. Punishment. Punishment through flames. Or both. Chapter 69. Next day, late July of summer 15, there was a lunch at Claremont. Another lunch like the other lunches set out on a big table. More tears. The voices were so loud that the liars came up the walkway from Redgate and stood at the foot of the garden listening. I have to earn your love every day, Dad, Mommy slurred, and most days I fail. It's not fucking fair. Carrie gets the pearls, Bess gets the Boston house, Bess gets Windmere, Carrie has Johnny, and you'll give him Claremont. I know you will. I'll be left alone with nothing, nothing, even though Katie's supposed to be the one, the first, you always said. Granddad looked from his, stood from his seat at the head of the table. Penelope. I'll take her away, do you hear me? I'll take Katie away and you won't ever see her again. Granddad's voice boomed across the yard. This is the United States of America, he said. You don't seem to understand that, Penny, so let me explain. In America, here's how we operate. We work for what we want. And we get ahead. We never take no for an answer, and we deserve the rewards of our perseverance. Will Taft, are you listening? The little boys nodded, chins quivering. Granddad continued, We Sinclairs are a grand old family. That is something to be proud of. Our traditions and our values from the bedrock on which the future generations stand. This island is our home, and as my father's and my grandfather's before them, and yet the three of you women, with these divorces, broken homes, and disrespect for tradition, the lack of work ethic, you have done nothing but disappoint an old man who thought he raised you right. Dad, please, said Bess. Be quiet, thundered Granddad. You cannot expect me to accept your disregard for the values of this family and reward you and your children with financial security. You cannot any of you expect this, and yet day after day I see you do. I will no longer tolerate it. Bess crumpled in tears. Carrie grabbed Will by the elbow and walked towards the dock. Mommy threw her wine glass against the side of the Claremont house. Chapter 70. Mm -hmm. What happened then, I asked Johnny. We're still laying on the floor at Cuddle Down early in the morning. Summer 15, 17. Okay, so the last, like, ten chapters, they've all been, what do we call it? What's that called? What, what literary device is it? We, where, it's actually Summer 17, but they're looking back at Summer 15. Flashback. A flashback. Hey, I have to Ooh, more food. Do I have a candy cane? You, yeah, I've heard you this time, right? Thank you. I've been saying the answer every time that you don't answer. Oh, man. I got another great one. Oh, that's great. Um, Game's here, too. Yeah. Oh, Kiwi Cooler Daddy. Right. Uh, mango. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay. What happened then? Mango. I don't, you don't remember, he says? No. People started leaving the island. Carrie took Will to a hotel in Egertown and asked me and Gap to follow her as soon as we packed everything. The staff departed at 8. Your mother went to see that friend of hers at the vineyard. Alice? Yes, Alice came and got her. But you wouldn't leave. And finally she had to go without you. Granddad took off for the mainland. And then we decided about the fire. We planned it out, I say. We did. We convinced Bess to take the big boat and all of the littles and see a movie at the vineyard. As Johnny talks, the memories form. I fill in details he hasn't spoken aloud. When they left, we drank the wine they'd left corked in the fridge, says Johnny. Four open bottles, and Gat was so angry. He was right, I say. Johnny turns his face and speaks into the floor again. Because he wasn't coming back. If my mom married Ed, they'd be cut off. If my mom left Ed, Gat, Gat wouldn't be connected to our family anymore. Claremont was like a symbol of everything that was wrong. It was Mirren's voice. She came in so quietly. I didn't hear. She was now lying on the floor next to Johnny, holding his other hand. The seat of the patriarchy, says Gat. I didn't hear him come in either. He lies down next to me. You're such an ass, Gat, said Johnny kindly. You always say patriarchy. It's what I mean. You sneak it in whenever you can. Patri patriarchy on toast. Patriarchy in my pants. Patriarchy with a squeeze of lemon. Claremont seemed like the seat of the patriarchy, repeats Gat. And yes, we were stupid drunk. And yes, we thought we'd, they'd rip the family apart and we'd never come here again. We figured if the house was gone and the paperwork and the data was gone inside, then all of the objects they fought about were gone. Then the power would also be gone. We could be a family, says Mirren. 
it was like a purification, says Gap. She remembers the fu- that we set the fire is all, said Johnny, his voice suddenly loud. And some other things, I said, sitting up and looking at the liars in the morning light. Things are coming back as you're filling me in. We aren't telling you all the stuff that happened before we, we set the fire, Johnny said out loud. We are telling you all the stuff that happened. Yes, says Miran. We set a fire, I say in wonder. We didn't slop, sob and bleed. We did something instead. Made a change. Kind of, says Miran. Are you kidding? We burned that fucking palace to the ground. Ooh. <laughs> Chapter 71. After the aunties and granddad quarreled, I was crying. Gat was crying, too. He was going to leave the island, and I'd never see him again. He would never see me. Gat, my Gat. I never cried with anyone before. At the same time, he cried like a man, not a boy. Not like he was frustrated or he hadn't gotten his way, but like life was bitter. Like his wounds couldn't be healed. I wanted to heal them for him. We ran down to the tiny beach alone. I clung to him and we sat together in the sand. And for once, he had nothing to say. No analysis, no questions. Finally, I said something about what if. What if we took it into our own hands? And Gat said, how? And I said something about what if what if we could stop the fighting? And he gave we have something to save. And Gat said, Yes, you and me and Miran and Johnny, yes we do. But of course we can always see each other, the four of us. Next year we can drive, there's always the phone. But here I said this. Yes, here he said this. You and me. I said something about what if what if we could stop somehow stop being the beautiful Sinclair family and just be a family? What if we could stop seeing different colors, different backgrounds, and just be in love? What if we could force everyone to change, force them? You want to play God, Gat said. I want to take action, I said. There is always the phone, he said. But what about here? I said this. Yes, here, he said this. Gat was my love, my first and only. How could I let him go? He was the person who couldn't fake a smile, but smiled often. He wrapped my wrist in white gauze and believed wounds needed attention. He wrote on his hands and asked me my thoughts. His mind was restless, relentless. He didn't believe in God anymore, and yet he still wished that God would help him. And now he was mine, and I said that we should not let our love be threatened. We we should not let the family fall apart. We should not accept an evil we can change. We We would stand up against it, would we not? Yes, we would. We would be heroes, even. So whose idea was it to set the fire? Katie's. But Katie doesn't remember. Katie remembers now. Gat and I talked to Miran and Johnny, convinced them to take action. We told each other over and over, do what you're afraid to do. We told each other over and over. We said it. We told each other. We were right. Chapter 72. The plan was simple. We would find the spare jugs of gas, and the ones kept in the shed for the motorboats. There was newspapers and cardboard in the mudroom. We'd build piles of recycling and soak those in gasoline. We'd soak the wood floors as well. Stand back, light a paper towel, and throw it. Easy. We would light every floor, every room if possible, to make sure Claremont burned completely. Gat in the basement, me on the ground floor, Johnny on the second, Mirren on the top. The fire department arrived really late, said Mirren. Two fire departments, says Johnny. Woods Hole and Martha's Vineyard. We were counting on that, I said, realizing. We planned to call for help, says Johnny. Of course someone had to call or it would look like arson. We were going to say that we were all at Cuddle Down watching a movie. You know how the trees surrounded it. You couldn't see another house unless you go to the roof, so it made sense that no one would have called. Those fire departments are mainly volunteers, says Gat. They have no clue. No, old wood house, tinderbox. If the aunts and granddad suspected us, they'd never prosecute, adds Johnny. It was easy to bank on that. Of course they wouldn't prosecute. No one here is a criminal. No one is an addict. No one is a failure. I felt a thrill of what we had done. My full name is Cadence Sinclair Eastman, and contrary to the expectations of the beautiful family in which I was raised, I am an arsonist. A visionary, a heroine, a rebel. The kind of person who changes history. A criminal. But if I am a criminal... Am I then an addict? Am I then a failure? My mind is playing with twists of meaning, as it always does. We made it happen, I say. Depends on what you think it is, says Mirren. We saved the family. They started over. Aunt Carrie's wandering around the island at night, says Mirren. My mother's scrubbing clean sinks until her hands are raw. Penny watches you sleep and writes down what you eat. 
They drink a fuckload. They're getting drunk until the tears roll down their faces. When you, when are you even at New Claremont to see that? I say, I get up there now in the mirror and says, you think we solved everything, Katie? But I think it was. We're here. I persist. Without the fire, we wouldn't be here. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Granddad held so much power, I say, and now he doesn't. He he changed and we changed an evil we saw in the world. I understand so much that wasn't clear before. My tea is warm. The liars are beautiful. Cuddle down is beautiful. It doesn't matter if there are stains on the wall. It doesn't matter if I have headaches or Mirren is sick. It doesn't matter if Will has nightmares and Gat hates himself. We have committed a perfect crime. Granddad only lacks power because he is demented, says Mirren. He would still torture everybody if he could. I don't agree with you, says Gat. Near Claremont seems like a <clears throat> new Claremont seems like a punishment to me. What, she asks? A self punishment. He built himself a home that isn't a home. It's deliberately uncomfortable. Why would you why would he do that? I asked. Why did he give all away all why did you give away all of your belongings? Gat asks. He's staring at me. They were all staring at me. To be charitable, I answer, to do some good in the world. There's a strange silence. I hate clutter, I say. No one laughs. I don't know how this conversation became all about me. None of the liar speaks for a long time. Then Johnny says, don't push it, Gat. And Gat says, I, I'm glad you remember the fire cadence. And I say, yeah, well, some of it. And Miran says she doesn't feel well, and she's going back to bed. The boys and I lay on the kitchen floor and stare at the ceiling for a while longer, until I realize with some embarrassment that they have both fallen asleep. Chapter 73. I find my mother in the Windmere porch with the Goldens. She's crocheting a scarf of pale blue wool. You're, down, you're always at cuddle down, Mommy complains. It's not good for you to be down there all the time. Carrie went yesterday looking for something, and she said it was filthy. What have you been doing? Nothing. Sorry about the mess. If it's really dirty, we can't ask Jenny to clean it. You know that, right? It's not fair to her. And Bess will have a fit if she sees it. I don't want anyone coming to cuddle down. I want it just for us. Don't worry. I sit, I sit down and pat Bosch on his sweet yellow head. Listen, Mommy. Yes. Why did you tell the family not to talk to me about the fire? She puts down her yarn and looks at me for a long time. You remember the fire? Yeah, last night it came rushing back. I don't remember all of it, but yeah. I remember it happened. I remember you all argued and everyone left the island. I remember I was here with Gat, Mirren, and Johnny. Do you remember anything else? What the sky looked like with the flames, the smell of the smoke. If, Mir if Mommy thinks I am out in any way at fault, she will never, ever ask me. I know she won't. She doesn't want to know. I've changed the course of her life. I've changed the fate of the family, the liars and I. It was a horrible thing to do, maybe, but it was something. I, it wasn't sitting by complaining. I'm a more powerful person than my mother will ever know. I've trespassed against her and helped her, too. She strokes my hair. So cloying. I pull back. That's all? She asks. Why doesn't anyone talk to me about it? I repeat. Because of your... Because of... Mommy stops, looking for words. Because of your pain. Because I have headaches. Because I can't remember the accident. I didn't. I can't handle the idea that Claremont burned down. The doctors told me not to add stress to your life, she says. They say the fire might have been triggered by the headaches. Might have triggered the headaches. Whether it was smoke inhalation or, or fear, she finishes lamely. I'm not a child, I say. I could be trusted to know basic information about our family. All summer, I've been working to remember my accident and what happened right before. Why not tell me, Mommy? I did tell you two years ago. I told you over and over, but you never remembered it the next day. And when I talked to the doctor, he said I shouldn't keep upsetting you that way. I shouldn't keep pushing you. You live with me, I cry. Don't you have any faith in your own judgment over that of some doctor who barely knows me? He's an expert. What makes you think I'd want my whole extended family keeping secrets from me? Even the twins, even Will and Taff, for God's sakes. Rather than know what had happened, what makes you think I'm so fragile I can't even know simple facts? You seem that fragile to me, says Mommy. And to be honest, I haven't been sure that you could handle your re I could handle your reaction. You can't even imagine how insulting that is. I love you, she says. I can't look at her pitying, self-justifying face any longer. Chapter 74 
Mirren is in my room when I open the door. She's sitting at my desk with her laptop on my, with her hand on my laptop. I wonder if I could read those emails you sent me last year. See, she says, do you still have them on your computer? Yeah, I never read them. To start at the start of the summer, I pretended I did, but I never even opened them. Why not? I just didn't. She said, I thought it didn't matter, but now I think it does. And look, she makes her voice light. I even left the house to do it. I small, I swallow as much anger as I can. I understand not writing back, but why wouldn't you even read my emails? I know, it sucks, and I'm a horrible wench. Please, will you let me read them now? I open the laptop, do a search, and I find all the notes addressed to her. There are 28. I read over her shoulder. Most, most of them are charming, darling emails from a person supposedly without headaches. Mirren, tomorrow I leave for Europe with my cheating father, who, as you know, is also deeply boring. Wish me luck and know that I wish I were spending the summer on Beachwood with you and Johnny and, and Gat. I know, I know, I should be over it. I am over it. I am. Off to Mirabella to meet attractive Spanish boys. So there. I wonder if I can take Dad to eat the most disgusting foods in, of every country we visit, as penis for running off to Colorado. That I can. If he really loves me, he'll eat frogs and kidneys and chocolate-covered ants. Cadence. That's how most of them go. But a few emails are neither charming nor darling. Those ones are the most pitiful and true. Mirren. Vermont winter. Dark, dark. Mommy keeps looking at me while I sleep. My head hurts all the time. I don't know what to do to make it stop. The pills don't work. Someone's spinning through the top of my head with an axe. A messy axe that won't make a clean cut through my skull. Whoever wields it has a hack is a hack away has to hack away at my head, coming down over and over and over. But it's not always in the right in the same place. I have multiple wounds. I dream sometimes that the person wielding the axe is granddad. Other times it's me. Other times the person is Gat. Sorry to sound crazy. My hands are shaky as I type this and the screen is too bright. I want to die sometimes. My head hurts so much. I keep writing you all of my brightest thoughts, but I never say the dark ones, even though I think them all the time. So I'm saying them now, even if you do not answer. I know I will know somebody heard them, and that at least is something. Cadence. We read all 28 emails. When she's finished, Mirren kisses me on the cheek. I can't even say sorry, she tells me. There's not a scribble word for how, I, how bad I feel. Then she's gone. Chapter 75. I bring my laptop to the bed and create a document. I take down my graph paper notes and begin typing those in, in all of my new memories, fast and with a thousand errors. I fill in the gaps with guesses that I cannot, that I don't have actual recall. Sinclair Center for Socialization and Snacks. You won't see that boyfriend of yours again. He wants me to stay the hell away from you. We adore Windmere, don't we, Katie? Aunt Carrie crying over Johnny's windbreaker. Gap throwing balls for the dogs in the tennis courts. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. The dogs. The fucking dogs. Fatma and Prince Philip. The Goldens died in the fire. I know it now, and it's my fault. They were such naughty, naughty dogs. Not like Bosch, Grindle, and Poppy, whom Mommy trained. Fatma and Prince Philip ate starfish on the shore, then vomited them up in the living room. They shook water from their shaggy fur. Snarfled people's picnic lunches. Chewed frisbees into hunks of unusable plastic. They loved tennis balls and would go down to the court and slime any that had been left around. They would not sit when told. They begged at the table. When the fire caught, the dogs were, were in one of the upstairs guest bedrooms. Granddad had often closed them upstairs while Claremont was empty or at night. That way they wouldn't eat people's boots or howl at the screen door. Granddad had shut them up there before he left the island, and we hadn't thought of them. I had killed those dogs. I was the one who lived with dogs, who knew where Prince Philip and Fatima slept. The rest of the liars didn't think about the Goldens, not very much anyway, not like I did. They had burned to death. How could I forgive them? How have I, could I have forgotten them like that? How could I have been so wrapped up in my own stupid criminal exercise, the thrill of it? My own anger at the aunties and granddad. Fatma and Prince Philip burning, sniffing at the hot door. Breathing in smoke, wagging their tails, hopefully, waiting for someone to come and get them, barking. What a horrible death. For those poor, dear, naughty dogs. We're going to stop there for the day. The dogs are dead. The dogs are dead. Mm -hmm.